Okay, Real Progressives. My name is Jeff Ginter. It's Wednesday. It is September 5th. First day of school for many of us. That is a wonderful, joyous, happy, disgusting day. Uh, but it will lead us into the beginning of the topic that I wanted to cover today. Um, I'll be honest with you, straight up, I had a most wonderful weekend reconnecting with family. My brother came into town. It was incredible, uh, and it really gave me an opportunity to think about not, not just family, you know, although that's incredibly important, and you get to define that any way you want. You know, we all know that there are people out there who are not fond of their brothers and sisters, as I am with mine. Uh, I am fond of my brothers and sisters. Uh, but you will find a cocoon of friends, you know, that you will call a family or consider a family, even if you don't use that word. It's family. It's love. And I, it gave me a lot of time to reflect and think about what is it that we want to accomplish. I mean, clearly, if you're watching this show at all, you don't like what's happening in the world today. You don't like what's happening in this country. You don't like the way people are being treated. You don't like a wide variety of things. So what is it that you do want? There's an old philosophy, um, philosophical expression, an old spiritual ideology that says, stop focusing on what you don't want. The universe doesn't give a shit what you actually want. It cares about what you focus on. You say, I hate my job. All the universe hears is job. doesn't hear that you hate your job. doesn't hear that you don't want to do your job. All it hears is job. So it gives you what you're thinking about. More of the job, more of the job, more of the job. Focus on the things that you do like. Again, I'm not trying to turn this into a spiritual mumbo-jumbo thing. Believe these things, don't believe these things. But there are practical applications to what I'm talking about right now. We spend a lot of time throwing shade on people that uh, don't believe the things that we believe. We spend a lot of time uh, shaming them. We spend a lot of time trying to correct them. We spend a lot of time doing these things. And I am in no way, shape, or form saying stop doing that. What I am saying is we need to increase talking about the things that we do want, talking about the things that we do love, talking about the way that we want to be able to be in the world and the world that we want to be in. I fail more often than I succeed at what I'm about to describe. But you got to try. You know what I mean? You got to try. Everything that I do what I want to achieve is what I'm doing. Is it bringing me closer to the world that I want to be in? I was speaking to someone at work today about how they were in New York City and there was a homeless person and their 11-year-old daughter wanted to be able to give a dollar. And my friend said that she and her husband were a little worried. What if, you know, what if their daughter was accosted? What if it was dangerous? So they said, no, don't do it. And they, she said she later regretted, you know, because she would want to give a dollar, but she was a little afraid. And she was feeling bad about herself. And I told her, don't feel bad. Okay? But with everything that you want to do, like she said, would you have done? I said, yes, I would have. Because if I see someone who is suffering, do I not want to alleviate that suffering? If I have the means to do it, why wouldn't I do it? Because the world that I want to bring into creation doesn't have that person suffering in the first place. But so long as that is the case, I see suffering, I want to alleviate that suffering. So yes, of course I would approach. Yes, I would give money. Why wouldn't I? Because not giving money, not looking that person in the eye, walking the other direction, increases the fear. It increases the things in the world that I don't want to have happen. So what kind of a world do you want to be in? What kind of a world do you want to bring into creation? Because I tell you, what I said before, decisions are made by those who show up. And if you're not showing up at town halls, you are at least showing up in your life. You are at least showing up at work. You are showing up with your family. You are showing up with friends. You are showing up somewhere. And everything that you do 
is going to come back at you in some form. Everything that you do is going to be on display for those people that also showed up. You get to lead by example. You get to do things in your life that can enrich other people's or make it shittier. As John Lennon once said, we all have Jesus in us, we all have uh, Christ, we all have Hitler in us. You choose. There is no action too small that won't have a ripple effect somewhere. So what kind of world do you want to live in? What kind of world do you want to be a part of? And if you're watching this show, you clearly don't want to be a part of the world that we have all with our actions or inactions, helped create. You don't want to be a part of that. So what do you want? And you've got to be clear about this. And I have a vision about this. I know what I want. And there's several steps that I want. First, I want single-payer health care. I don't want anyone going to GoFundMe to be able to pay for their gunshot wounds. I don't want anyone to have to become homeless because they couldn't afford their health care bill. I don't want anyone to have to deal with anything other than getting better after a sudden illness. I certainly don't want them having to fight an insurance company, fight a hospital bill, take badly needed energy away from healing energy, healing thoughts, and giving that away to a corporation that just wants to make money off of them. Single-payer health care. You're sick, you go to a doctor. Single-payer health care. You're not sick, but you want to take preventative medicine. Go see a doctor. Go see a dietitian. Go see a dentist. Go see anyone and anything in the healthcare industry that is going to help you realize health, longevity, prosperity. And it shouldn't cost you a dime. In the world's richest economy. Notice I said economy. I didn't just simply say richest country. That brings to mind dollar signs. We've got it. No, it's not about money. It's about resources. And we have it in abundance. Real resources. Physical resources. Human resources. We have all that. The question becomes, what are we going to do with all those resources? with all this abundance that we are surrounded with by. What are we going to do with it? What do you want to do with it? It's all being done in your name. So what do you want to do? I want single-payer health care. I don't want anyone, anywhere, ever, to go without health care for any reason. Step number one, cover everyone. Cover everyone from the only entity that can actually get the job done fully, and that's the federal government. Next thing I want, I want a federal job guarantee. I want to make sure that every person that wants a job will have a job easily, simply. You simply go down to the employment office and you get yourself a job. You sign up for whatever is available and there is no shortage of available work. If you're worried about what kind of work we're talking about, use your imagination. It's going to be a little bit difficult to use the imagination because it's all been sucked right out of us. Over entertained with TV and radio and internet and movies. All of which is great and I'm not saying anything bad, uh, bad against them. But just like drugs, you got to be able to take things in stride. Can't lose yourself in there. You can't just turn off your brain and just passively watch things all the time. You have to engage. The imagination is critical. The imagination is what got us where we are right now. All these technological marvels did not just come from automation. They came from imagination. So use yours. If you say the robots are coming to take our jobs and all the manual labor is going overseas, there's nothing left for us to do, are you actually going to throw up your hands at that point and say, well, I guess we're just going to have to have unemployment? No. Use your imagination. And for all the work that could be done, that should be done, 
that would enrich our communities, but it isn't going to be profitable for anyone to put their money into to make sure it happens. The federal government comes in and gets it done. Have you seen the dust bowls that is small town America from sea to shining sea? Because all the capital evaporated, left, vanished, because the people that owned the capital couldn't find a way to make profit. And more and more, more and more profit is demanded. So take profit off the table. Just put people to work. And I'm not talking about moving paper from here to here. I'm talking about the arts. I'm talking about care. I'm talking about restaurants. I'm talking about anything you can think of that would enrich the community. You're saying the automation is taking away our work and that's horrible? Screw that. All the jobs that are going away, you didn't want anyway. They were called low-wage jobs. No one wanted them. They were shit jobs. No one was proud to have them. They were proud to be able to have a job. They were proud to be able to put a roof over their head and send their kids to college. But these weren't jobs that were fulfilling anyone's lives. But that was back when we had to monetize everything. Use your imagination. Don't have to do that shit no more. Yes, by all means, bring on the machines. Get everything done with a push of a button. That's a good thing. Freeze us up to do other things. What other things? Use your imagination. Whatever you can think of. As long as it has public purpose. I want that. So no one will ever be able to have unemployment unless they want it. If you want unemployment, fair enough, we have that too. But if you want to work, if you want to participate, if you want to be part of society, we have that too. And it's a living wage everywhere in the country. Small town America comes back, baby. You don't have to move from the place that you were born and love just to be able to get a career, just to be able to get a job. If there's a job and a career that has to be somewhere else, fair enough, you do that. But how many people are forced away from the place that they grew up in? Not because they wanted to, but because they had to. And how many people were forced to leave that second place because there was no more work? And how many people got a new job, but it paid less? And then that one goes away, and they get a new job. But you know what? It pays even less. But hey, you're employed. That brings the unemployment numbers down, depending upon how you want to parse those numbers. But I dream of a world in which everyone has a job that wants one. And the job that you do get is a living wage, complete with full benefits. I have a dream that anyone that wants to have an education gets one. All the way up to Ph.D. Why not? You tell me why not. I shouldn't have to defend why I want to do it. You tell me why it shouldn't be done. Don't tell me that it can't, because that is a losing argument right from the start. You tell me why it shouldn't be done. You make that case, and I'll listen. You start with the it can't be done, eh, sorry, you're done. You tell me why it shouldn't be done. In the world's richest economy, with the richest resources available. And you're telling me we can't give everyone a free education? Uh-uh. We can. You tell me why not. You come up with that argument and you defend it. And I'll listen. I dream of a world where we are no longer on fossil fuels. Ever. At all. No more. 100% green energy, 100% renewables. Why not? You tell me why not. Stop telling me to defend why we should do it. I want to hear from you why it shouldn't be done. I am sick to death of having to defend progressive policies because you keep telling me it can't be done. I'm sitting here and I'm telling you, I'm looking you in the face. It can be done. You simply have to decide to do it. You come up with an argument telling me why it should not be done. 
and I will listen to that argument, and we will talk about it. You come up with an argument that says it can't be done, and you're done. You don't get an audience for that argument. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bing! You're done. Of course it can be done. It simply must be decided upon. So the question is always, should we do it? Should we or should we not? It's never about can we or can we not. Unless you can prove to me that we don't have the resources, which is the only barrier to getting anything done. I want to change the conversation in this country. Never can or can't, should or should not. But everyone gets an education. I want to see an education system in this country that actually looks to the individual. Where are your talents best served? What are your passions? What can you contribute passionately? Not just kind of, sort of. What do you want to do? You tell me what is wrong with coming up with a system that allows everyone that lives and breathes to be able to find their place in society that best serves society. And in 300, pardon me, excellent lunch. In 360 million people in this country, you're telling me that with all that creativity brought to bear, that we won't be able to get all the work done that needs to get done? Yes, someone's going to have to pick up the trash. But then we could also put someone to work coming up with a way to automate that so that the trash can wor the trash worker doesn't have to do that anymore and they can move on to something more meaningful but in the meantime until that comes along we should at least pay that person a living wage a wage with dignity you know why cuz you don't want to pick up the trash it's not because it's low-skilled labor. It's still their time. It is their entire lives. It's what they do eight hours a day, five days a week. And in today's economy, it's more like 16 hours a day, seven days a week. That's their lives. That's their time. That's time away from their kids, time away from their wives and their, and their husbands. You don't want to do it. You want to spend your time going God knows what. No one wants to do that job, but someone has to right now until it gets automated away. And while it's being done, give them a goddamn livable wage. Give them some dignity. And if you don't think it's worth it, have them all stop. Have them all stop right now. And you deal with your own fucking trash. Then you tell me exactly how worth it it is to you to have someone paid to do it. How many of your rich motherfuckers cleaned up your own mansions? Oh no, you have a staff do that for you? Well, I guess you found that it was worth it to have someone done. So give them a living wage, whether they be your personal butler or the lowliest sanitation worker in New York City scrubbing the toilets clean. Someone's got to get it done. So pay them. Because clearly there's value there. High cost value, otherwise you would do it yourself. Everyone gets a job. Everyone gets an education. Everyone gets health care. And fossil fuels go bye-bye. 100% green energy. Change the grid. Do it now. Do all these things while we can. While there's still time. From an environmental standpoint, how much time do you think we have? I don't know. You want to find out? I don't. So get it done now. If the worst thing that happens, if the worst thing that happens is all the conservatives are right and nothing bad was ever going to happen and we actually destroyed the economy, turning everything over to green energy. Whoops. Our bad. But hey, we got a whole new industry of green energy. And a wrecked economy can always come back. Now go the other way. Turns out there is an Armageddon the likes of which even the most diehard liberal never saw coming. And it's too late to do anything about it and we all die. Whoops. Sorry. Our bad. But, you know, 
A genocidal apocalypse can always be undone. Oh, no, wait a minute. Sorry. No, it can't. You all like to go to Las Vegas and Atlantic City? You want to play the odds? Go for the green energy. Uh, green energy for the win? Thank you. Do it while we can. For all the other things, do it while we still can, peacefully. We got 40 to 60% of the country living in poverty. You know what that tells me? That tells me that trouble is just around the corner. When you have more than half of your population in poverty or just about there, one bad paycheck away from falling into poverty and a system designed to ensure that once you fall into poverty, it is almost impossible to get out. That is a system that has failed. You cannot possibly tell me that poverty is about laziness and apathy when almost half the country is already living in it and more than half the country is in danger of falling into it. There is no way that laziness or unlucky you know, circumstances has anything whatsoever to do with it. It has everything to do with a system that has absolutely positively guaranteed that if you're already wealthy, you get everything and you get more and more and more. And you take away from those who cannot defend themselves. So we must change that while we can. All the school shootings, all the suicides, all the violence... What do you think that comes from? Well, I'll tell you, if you think it comes from any one thing, you are deluding yourself. It comes from a variety of things. Because for 40 plus years, we have had a variety of things happen to us. We have allowed a variety of things to happen to us. Economic insecurity, leading to more and more mental health, leading to more and more disasters. Anyone that's been picking up a gun and shooting people, are they happy? Are these happy individuals? I don't care if you think they're mentally ill or not. Are they happy? No. It's hard to be happy when you come from systemic poverty. It's hard to be happy when you have economic insecurity your entire life. When you work your ass off and you never gain an inch, you are always just treading water in an economy that is telling you out of one side of its mouth that if you work hard enough, you'll be able to reach Shangri-La. And out of the other side of its mouth, it's telling you, just give up. Just. It's crazy making. And if you can't feel that something bad is coming, I don't know what to tell you. And I hope to God I'm wrong. But that's why I'm putting a fire under your ass saying, get moving. Wake up. Do something. Do something now. You're watching this video? That's great. But share it. Wake up other people. You don't want to share this one? Share something. Write a letter. Talk to your friends. Don't let a conversation in an ATM vestibule go by without bringing up economic insecurity, without bringing up systemic racism, without bringing up the uh, healthcare uh, industry that is trying to destroy us. Do it. Don't be passive any longer. That's what led us here more than anything else. It is the passive acceptance of what we have seen around us. That has allowed the rich and the powerful to be able to get away with what they've gotten away with for so long. I mean, just, just, just look at what the rich and powerful do within the Democratic Party. Again, I'm not trying to say anything about the Democrats. I'm not saying anything about the Republicans. As far as I'm concerned, you're a political party. You're already part of the problem. They have used political parties as weapons against us 
So if you're in one of these parties, you want to do good, that's fantastic. I have no hope for you, but I hope you prove me wrong. You prove me wrong. I'm a member of the Democratic Party. I'm trying to do something, and I'm not sure if I'm deluding myself, but let's see what we can do. And if you're trying to start a third party, God love you, but you're st- be careful what you're starting. But we just heard that the Democratic Party has just done landslide reforms. Landslide reforms. Saying that they are going to reduce the uh, role of superdelegates in the first round of voting at conventions. So fantastic. They will not have as much to do. The first round of voting will happen without them. And if a, a grassroots progressive member you know, can actually get the majority of the votes, then they will get through. But what did they do just a few weeks ago? They put into effect an order, and done in secret, done without any input, to say that you can't run in a presidential primary as a Democrat unless the um, chairman of the Democratic National Party approves of you, says that there is enough evidence that you are a loyal Democrat, that you have sufficient history of writings and motions to say that you are loyal to the Democratic Party. How in God's name is it okay to be loyal to a party? Are we not supposed to be loyal to the people of the United States? How did it get to the point where loyalty to a political party is the litmus test for whether or not they could run for president of the United States? And of course, they're saying, no, no, no. It's not that they can't run for president of the United States. It's just that they can't run as a Democrat. Well, there's no such thing as a perfect Democrat. FDR was a Democrat, and he wouldn't be able to do anything with today's Democrats. But he was a Democrat. LBJ wouldn't get anywhere as a Democrat in the modern era. Ronald Reagan wouldn't have anything to do with the modern-day Republicans. So you tell me, what is a classic Democrat? And one person gets to decide who that person is. That is not democracy. They're telling us with one hand, we are going to reduce, not eliminate, we are going to reduce the use of superdelegates, give you the illusion that a grassroots uh, upstart can actually win. But on the other hand, they'll also make it such that anyone they think is too risky doesn't even get in at all. You and I have no say. So what do you want to do? I think it's perfectly clear that we have to be thinking big. We have to be thinking bold. And we have to be able to think with ninja-like dexterity. And I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I want to play you something uh, from Alan Greenspan. As God knows, this subject has a lot of relevance. Not so much the particular video that I'm about to show, which has tremendous relevance to what I'm talking about in terms of finance, how we're going to get the things that I've been talking about. But there's been a lot of discussion going on recently since John McCain died you know, do we want to canonize him? Do we want to demonize him? Do we want to do this? Do we want to do that? To which I say, it's complicated. And why shouldn't it be complicated? I'll explain more in just a second. Watch this. So having personal retirement accounts is, a, is another way of making a, a future retiree benefits more secure for their retirement. And also, do you believe that personal retirement accounts as a component to a system of solvency does help improve solvency because when you have a personal retirement account policy, it, it's accompanied with a benefit offset. With that feature in place, do you believe that personal retirement accounts can help us achieve solvency for the system and make those future retiree benefits more secure? Well, I, w- I wouldn't say that the uh, pay-as-you-go benefits are insecure in the sense that uh, <clears throat> There's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. The question is, how do you set up a system which assures that the real assets are created which those benefits are employed to purchase? 
So it's not a question of security. It's a question of the structure of a financial system which assures that the real resources are created for retirement as distinct from the cash. The cash itself is nice to have, but uh, it's got to be in the context of the real resources being created at the time those benefits are paid so that you can purchase real resources with the benefits, which of course are cash. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if you're into MMT, if you're into modern monetary theory, you know, new chartalism, whatever you want to call it, if you're into it, you've seen that video a thousand times. And there's a specific purpose, dual purpose, why I'm showing this tonight. First is to just reinforce the idea that even someone you know, like Alan Greenspan, who was not a liberal, um, even someone like Alan Greenspan, when pressed, under oath, will tell you to your face that there is nothing preventing the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to someone. The federal government creates the currency. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. It creates the currency. It sets the value, meaning it tells you how much one U.S. dollar is worth. And since 1971, it has not been worth any gold. It is simply $1 to $1 ratio. That's it. It's worth whatever you can spend it on. And three, it will enforce the need for that currency through taxation. Government does not need your money to be able to use it as revenue. It doesn't need it for revenue. It needs you to need its currency so that the currency has value. And because the currency has value, people will accept it. And that's what allows the federal government to regulate the economy with its currency. Anyone who wants more explanations about that, look up Real Progressives. There's a metric ton of resources there. Look up Stephanie Kelton. I'll put up you know, the, uh, the experts in just a moment, but I want to finish this point before I do that. So he goes before Congress and says, you don't need to privatize anything in order to make it solvent. It's already, technically speaking, solvent because the government can simply create the money to make it solvent. Payments are due, create the money, and pay it. Doesn't matter. What he went on to say is that the real trick is to make sure that any time you create money, that there is slack in the economy to absorb that money creation without creating inflation. So by the time you turn 65 and you're getting your Social Security benefits, are there resources in abundance for you to be able to spend that money without competing other people for the same resources, driving up the cost? As long as we are a productive society to be able to absorb the money we are creating, we're good to go. And by many estimates, we're $2 trillion a year away from having an inflation problem. We have huge amounts of slack in our economy. So let's use it. Why? Because people are suffering. But to continue my point, Alan Greenspan, out of one side of his mouth, says the truth about the economy, about how money is created, and the fact that the federal government has no restrictions on creating that money except for inflation. That's it. We're no longer financially constrained. We are resource constrained. However, he also went ahead and said this. When Alan Greenspan was testifying before Congress in 1997, on the marvels of the economy he was running, he said straight out that one of the bases for its economic success was imposing what he called greater worker insecurity. If workers are more insecure, that's very healthy for the society because if workers are insecure, they won't ask for wages. They won't go on strike. They won't call for benefits. They'll serve the masters gladly and passively. And that's optimal for corporations' economic health. 
At the time, everyone regarded Greenspan's comments as reasonable, judging by the lack of reaction and the great acclaim he enjoyed. So what is he saying? He is saying the federal government can create all the money necessary to do whatever it wants to do, but don't do it. Because he wants to benefit society. Well, whose society? High society. He's talking about class warfare. I remember the 90s perfectly. Class warfare was a dirty word. Fox News saw to that. The Wall Street Journal saw to that. Don't talk about class warfare. You're just jealous. You're jealous that I am able to steal from the economy with greater success than you are. And I, for one, will not stand for it, sir. Well, fuck you very much. He's telling you don't do it because if workers are secure, they will demand more. They will demand more. Now, maybe just to give him the benefit of the doubt, maybe he's actually worried that we will actually demand more and more and more. And if you have a small group of people like the uber rich demanding more and taking it, that that might still leave enough left over to make sure that we all don't die. But if everyone demands more, and they all get a taste for it, and no one's ever satisfied, they keep going for more, for more, for more, for more, for more, for more. Okay, I'll give them the benefit of that doubt. Why? Because I'm complicated, and so are you, and so is he, and so is everyone else in the world. Be complicated, but be a thinking complicated individual. Understand that there are complexities that need to be understood, but don't be afraid of those complexities. Embrace those complexities. Learn about them. Find out about them like your life depends on it. You know why? Because it does. Your life actually does depend on it. So to his problem, my assumption of his problem, to be sure, um, we'll find out you know, here. This is the graph that I show very often to show what happens once we went off the gold standard. And Alan Greenspan was a man who loved his gold. He loved the gold standard. Thought that it gave great money, to great value to the dollar and great restraint. What he doesn't say is that in addition to that restraint, you cannot just simply spend and spend and spend and spend if you are defending gold reserves. You have to be able to use that, that spending wisely. You can only spend so much. There can only be so much money in circulation if you are defending your gold reserves. So you have to tax, you have to borrow. Almost no one that talks about the gold standard and the joys of going back there will also say that in that era that the rich were taxed to an ungodly amount. Because if you need money to be able to do programs... And you can't just simply print your way out of it. You have to tax and borrow. Who are you taxing and borrowing it from? You created the money in the first place, but it all pools in different areas. It doesn't pool to the poor. It pools to the rich. So you have to be able to tax the rich to be able to do what you want to do. So everyone that says they want to go back to a gold standard, they want to tie our hands behind our back. Not just one, but both. But I guarantee you they're also not going to like the idea of taxing the rich so that we can actually afford the programs that we still need. Uh, They got rid of the gold standard, brought down the tax for all the rich because we could, and they got more money, they got more rich. Now they want to bring back the gold standard, they're not going to tax the rich. No, 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 no. They'll just get rid of everything else. Now, what this graph shows is not what happens as a natural consequence of when you go off a gold standard. This graph shows what happens as GDP keeps going up and our wages stagnate. That shows what happens when you go off a gold standard and the only ones who know what that means, what the ramifications of that are. The only ones who know are the rich and the ones in power. And they don't give a shit about you. They absolutely, positively don't give a shit about you. So they'll just keep taking and taking and taking and leaving less and less and less for you. 
So it's complicated. So what? Are you not up to that task? I think you are. I think you're amazing. And I don't even know who I'm looking at. Because you are. You are more capable than you could possibly imagine. How do I know? Because I was nothing. I was nothing for 47 years. And then I went to a town hall and all I did was open my mouth and people listened. What makes me different from you? Absolutely nothing. You are here for a reason. Find out what it is. Do something. Talk to people. Call someone. Call your congressman. Call your senator. Call your state representatives. Make sure your governor and your state reps understand about federal finance. You know what happens? This is going to get to the meat of it. What happens if we get single-payer health care? As far as I'm concerned, in addition to the health of the nation improving and the productivity of each citizen improving, you're no longer a slave to your job. You could actually quit your job as long as you had another one to go to, or you want to be an entrepreneur. How many people have great ideas, can't do it? Not just because they can't get the capital, but on top of the capital, they have to provide health care for their family, and they get it from their job. Just imagine the shackles that start to undo themselves once you realize that you get health care, top quality health care. No matter where you live in the country, no matter what job you have, it doesn't matter because it's not tied to your location or your job. Freedom increases. Choice increases. You get to choose whatever doctor you want. But people do lose. Insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, certain hospitals, medical manufacturers. They've all been pushing back against this. And they're the only ones really that are. There's a very, very small number of actual ideologues who thinks it's bad. The ones who are really pushing back hard are the industries that will be decimated or negatively impacted. It's an incredibly small portion of the population. But they've got a lot of money and a lot of power. But we could do something about that because we have more power than they could possibly bring to bear in our numbers if we do something about it. What happens if we get a federal job guarantee? Well, private industry is going to have to start paying people. There's so many people who don't defend a federal job guarantee because they think, well, what's going to happen to Walmart? What's going to happen to Amazon? What's going to happen to all these places? Mom and pop stores can't afford to pay people this much money. You're missing the larger picture. For one thing, if your business model cannot incorporate paying people a living wage, why should you be in business? I need you to defend that position. Why should they be in business if they can't afford to pay their employees a living wage? Why should they exist? But I'll put you another thing. If everyone does have a living wage, a livable wage, with dignity, and they could afford a roof over their head, and they could put nutritious food in their bellies, and they have health care, which, by the way, businesses won't have to flip the bill for. There will be more customers for their products. More customers, more people with cash on hand, disposable income that they will want to be able to spend into the economy. So now you need to make sure that you have a product that they want to buy. That's what capitalism is supposed to be. You're supposed to have an idea. There's supposed to be a need that you're supposed to fill. And you're supposed to be able to do it at an affordable price. But you should also be able to pay your employees a livable wage. And now go out and find a market for your great idea. And if you can't find a market for your idea, don't blame the, uh, the failure on the fact that you had to pay people a living wage. 
Maybe your marketing sucked. Maybe your idea sucked. Maybe you'll be able to turn that failure around and come up with an even better idea. Are you an entrepreneur or not? If your idea of turning a dollar only works when you can scam people, then you're not the kind of business owner we should have in this country. And if your business model is predicated on the notion of profiting off of other people's pain and suffering, then you shouldn't be in business. But those industries should still get paid. An interesting quandary. You're not allowed to be in business in healthcare if your business model is for profit, but people still need people to take care of the healthcare industry, and those people still need to get paid. Interesting quandary. Well, I guess it's going to have to be the federal goddamn government, isn't it? Because they're the only entity that can come up with the cash by creating it and spending it in the areas where we will be able to get that industry. We can get single-payer health care. Just let the federal government set up the structure, set up the program, make sure we have the resources that implement it, and they pay the individual vendors, the hospitals and the pharmaceutical companies and the medical manufacturing companies, and on and on and on. And you get to negotiate what those prices are going to be. The federal government may set the price, but you get to negotiate. Why? Because we, the people... Decisions are made by those who show up. So show up. Go to your town halls. Talk to your congressmen. Talk to your senators. Say that health care is a right. That health care is important. That doctors should be well compensated. Say that education is fundamental. We need to make sure that we radically change the way we address education in this country. And make sure that kids are well looked after and that we have institutions in place to make sure that every child gets the education they deserve. That we put teachers in schools, many teachers and assistant teachers, and we put in health care workers in schools. We don't need to put police in schools because if everyone has a job, everyone has a good paying job, no one has economic insecurity anymore, who's going to want to go around shooting up the place? We have a million problems, and it's going to take multiple solutions to deal with just one. So roll up your goddamn sleeves. Do something. Be a part of the solution. Have the conversation, uncomfortable though it may be, that we have to have. If you're not willing to talk about reparations, then when will that conversation ever happen? If you're not willing to have the conversation about reparations for Native Americans, for African Americans, when will that happen? I guarantee you, until those conversations happen, we're not going to have lasting peace. We're not going to have lasting prosperity. While we allow suffering to happen inside our borders, it's never going to happen. And then we can start exporting peace. We spend millions of dollars in Israel so that we can have an apartheid state in Palestine. How fucked up is that? The worst famine the world has ever seen is happening right now in Yemen, and we are financing that. Don't pat yourself on the back saying we're not dropping the bombs. No, we're just paying the people who are dropping the bombs. It's all happening in your name. And for anyone out there who thinks I just said something anti-Israel, no, I said something pro-Palestine. There's a difference. (coughs) You can be a Zionist and believe in the state of Israel's right to exist and still believe in a two-state system, in a free Palestine. You can believe in Zionism and still believe that Palestinians deserve to live in peace and harmony and dignity. With equality, you can be complicated. You can hold two thoughts in the head at the same time and not go crazy. Just like I could look at Alan Greenspan and say he understands about the uh, economy, even though I fundamentally disagree with him about how he wishes to use that knowledge. 
He would use the knowledge of how our finances actually operate to enslave an entire nation and say that it's good for society. And I say, no! We can use the knowledge of our economic system to emancipate everyone. And why not? Why would you not want to do that? Give me an argument, a cogent, coherent argument against saving everyone. It is doable. It is possible. It is not even socialism. For God's sakes, socialism is the government owning the means of production and then putting the screws to to make sure that you do what they want you to do. That makes government separate from you. But no, we the people, we decide. The government is just simply paying the bill and negotiating with business on your behalf with your input, if you're smart, to give your input. Notice I don't mean to say that dumb people should not give their input. Of course you should. Why? Because you're not dumb. You're not dumb. You have a right. You have a voice. You are a citizen. Participate. Be better today than you were yesterday. That's the challenge. That's what you can do. You don't know what to do right now? Fine. Read a book. L look at this video. Talk to Warren Mosler. Talk to Stephanie Kelton. I got a whole group of people here that you should be speaking to or reading about. Ask me about them. There is a roadmap to success. There is a roadmap to understanding the finances of this country and understanding that we can do it. We can do it all. It just takes political will. It just takes the knowledge of our financing and the limits of our resources. So can we do it all right now? Maybe, maybe not. But we can start the process of doing it all right now by deciding that single-payer health care is the way to go. Do we have the hospitals and the clinics and the doctors and everything ready to go? If yes, then do it, and we can move on to the next. If not, fine. What do we need? We need to build more hospitals. Fine. Do that. Do we have the resources to do that? Yes. Put them to work. Do we not? No. Can we get them? Yes. Do that. We want to be able to send everyone to college. Do we have enough colleges and teachers and administrators? Yes, do it. Or no, make them. It just takes resources and time. It's a simple formula. Resources plus time equals prosperity. You think the military-industrial complex got rich overnight? You think Wall Street happened overnight? No, it took time. It took time for them to have the power that they have right now. So we need to start right now. You don't have time to wait until tomorrow. you got to start right now. I'm Jeff Ginter with Real Progressives. If you want to help out Real Progressives, if you like what I'm talking about, if you like what Steve Grumbine is talking about, if you like what Stephanie Kelton is talking about, help us out. Send me a private message. Send it to Real Progressives. Reach out to Stephanie Kelton. Reach out to Warren Mosler. Ask questions. What can I do? How can I help? Because God knows we need the help. We need all the help we can get. And in this case, I am talking about both real progressives and the progressive movement as a whole. We need people involved. We need people motivated and organized. Nothing less than dedication and love is going to get us out of this. It was a long time coming, and it'll be a long time before it's over. But I intend to make sure that when I finally meet my maker, whatever she may look like, that there will have been single-payer health care and a federal job guarantee and 100% green energy and tuition-free college and peace in the Middle East and fair work dealings between nations all over the world. I am coming late to this game. I started when I was 47. 
At this rate, I'll probably be 120 before I'm allowed to die. But this is my goal. This is my penance. And I hope you're all in this with me. Because we can do it. Don't let anyone tell you that we can't. Don't let anyone deter you from the truth. And the truth is that nothing is beyond us. If you could dream it, you can make it work. There are deficits to be worried about, but the federal deficit is not one of them. But deficits of imagination, deficits of political will, deficits of desire. We've all had the life sucked out of us for so long. Been told that we have the lowest unemployment in 20 years. Who the fuck cares? You know why? Because those jobs suck. They don't pay much. Most of them are not full-time employ employment, and they don't come with benefits. But just because you have a job, suddenly they're bending over backwards to pat themselves on the back. We got the lowest unemployment in 20 years. woo -hoo! They don't actually pay attention to what the jobs are, how secure the jobs are, how much they pay, what kind of job satisfaction you get from these shit jobs. We can do better. We have to. What other purpose can there possibly be than being in service to one another? I am my brother's keeper. So are you. I'll be back next week. I want you to think about what I said. I want you to think about complications. I want you to think about how you don't have to be one thing or another. You don't have to be good or bad. I got people all over the world saying, Jeff, you're a great guy. You're this, you're that. No, I'm not. I'm really not. There is an aspect to me that is a great guy. There is a part of me that is a great guy, and it is real. And maybe it's the largest part of me. I don't know. But everyone has darkness in them. And I think a lot of people spend a lot of time being afraid of that darkness, being ashamed of it. I'm saying integrate it. I'm saying explore it. I'm saying use love, but don't use it to erase the other parts of you. Use love. Use complication. Allow yourself to be complicated. And if you can do that for yourself, the reason I want you to do this is so that you'll look to the people that are trying to lead us and realize that while they may not be the people you need them to be, you don't have to 100% write off everyone. It would be very easy, for example, to listen to Alan Greenspan. If the only thing you know about federal finance is that little snippet of Alan Greenspan that I played you and realize, aha, he's a hero. And then someone would show you that meme of him using that knowledge to enslave us. And then you would be tempted to say, well, then MMT must be bullshit. No. That's not the way it works. We are complicated. We are complicated individuals. So look for the gray areas. Look for ways that we can have conversations with people. We need to get people to understand federal finance, and they've been lied to for 40 years. So you don't need to get in their face and start calling them liars and stupid and all manner of things. Find things that the two of you can agree on and then start bringing up federal finance. Start showing them how federal finance can benefit them. And we can change minds because we're almost certainly not going to change the minds of the politicians. We're almost certainly not going to change the minds of the pundits on TV, though I encourage you to try. It is the minds of your neighbors and your friends that's who you got to reach. We need critical mass. And the more you can recognize and accept complications, the less likely you're going to be to write people off. We need allies. 
We need people on our side. We need to reach the people who would say, I would love to have single-payer health care, but I don't want my tax dollars paying for your health care. Why should I pay for your health care? Okay. First off, we agree we should have single-payer health care. That's the right way to go. You agree. You just think we can't do it. Well, let me show you how we can. You get enough people like that, and suddenly our allies rise exponentially. And we rise. And then we win. I love you guys. I'll be back next week. Take care of each other. Bye-bye.